actually it's an honor to be here. Hello, everybody. I see that many people are inside, which is exciting. I think we all miss that. <laughs> So I will start, Mark, um, and I was telling Mark that I have a very short video to provide a little bit of context of the area that we evaluated, and that also reflects uh, these informal settlements, these very poor settlements that we have in Latin America. So I will start with the video, and then I will start with the presentation of the findings of this research project with the specific methodology. That's fantastic. Thanks, Olga. Okay, so I'll start with the video. Nosotros intentable. Ese era nuestro mayor objetivo y era un sueño que que se nos hizo realidad. Ha sido ha sido una de las obras más importantes que que tenemos aquí en nuestra localidad. Cable fue una obra muy elegante, muy bonita que el pueblo le gustó mucho porque es muy cómoda, muy rápida y facilita de tomar el transporte. Mi nombre es Ana Mercedes Mora, soy la presidenta del barrio El Paraíso. Eh, vivo acá hace 33 años. Llevo como líder comunal 23 años. He participado de todos los proyectos de, que se encuentran en el, en el barrio. Yo soy Misael Rodríguez Ávila, tengo 64 años de edad. He vivido aquí en este barrio aproximadamente unos 37 años. Cuando llegamos a este barrio no teníamos servicios públicos, no teníamos agua, no teníamos luz, ni mucho menos transporte. Tocó sufrir mucho, mucho, porque nos tocaba por, por esa loma abajo. Realmente pues teníamos colectivos que nos traían, nos llevaban, unos piratas que llaman. Después de tener el sí del Transmilenio, en el 2007, más o menos a, llegaron a mi casa algunas personas de Medellín contándonos el proyecto de Transmicable. Pues eso nos interesa mucho, no solo acá en este barrio, sino en varias juntas de acción comunal. Ellos visitaron, acogimos la propuesta y nos dimos la tarea de lucharla hasta que hoy día gozamos de ese servicio. Con la avenida del Transmicable hubieron muchos proyectos y vino la, la, las instituciones e incluso la Universidad de los Andes también que, que ha venido haciendo un trabajo muy importante acá dentro de nuestra comunidad. Se hicieron muchos murales, se embelleció el barrio en cierta forma en algunas partes con la pintura de las fachadas y, y los murales porque hay unos murales muy bonitos murales muy bonitos. Se hicieron algunas vías, también se está haciendo el, el proyecto de lo que es el mirador, mirador Illimani, que es el parque que ya pronto se termina, ya va en un 70-80% más o menos. Va el corredor que va del transmicable al parque, eso va a quedar espectacular. Se están haciendo las obras del parque y eso por aquí viene mucha gente a mirar y les gusta. A pesar de que aquí nos tenían como zona roja, ya la gente está convencida que la cuestión no es esa. La cuestión es que por aquí hay buen pueblo. En cuanto al empleo también ha mejorado muchísimo la, para la calidad de vida de las personas, porque los empleados son de acá, de la localidad. Y a las familias les ha servido, especialmente a los niños, porque las madres salen a trabajar, generalmente hay mucha madre cabeza de hogar, entonces tienen más o menos 40 minutos, 40, 50 minutos más para dedicarle a sus hijos, ya sea en la mañana o sea en la tarde. El mayor impacto del transmisible es que es un transporte muy rápido. El transporte no es contaminante, es un buen transporte que, que de verdad merece que lo tuviera Bogotá. De lo que se podría mejorar, por ejemplo, la pavimentación del barrio. Es algo que nos falta porque en cuanto a algunas vías, precisamente con ese proyecto del cable, que es el contrato 451 de estudios y diseños de algunas vías. Nos faltan hacer como unas 30 vías más o menos que tienen sus estudios y diseños y está ahí, entonces no es justo como que se pierda ese trabajo. Falta como una universidad, un hospital que se atiende el pueblo, nos falta la pavimentación de, de, del barrio de, o de los barrios, porque aquí hay muchos barrios que estamos en la, en la misma situación la legalización de los que faltan por legalizar para que les metan infraestructura para mejoramiento de la calidad de vida de los habitantes. 
Eh, nos falta también, por ejemplo, que la empresa Lime eh, nos arregle el problema de las basuras. En general, que las instituciones no nos abandonen y que sigan, que vengan y que vengan y nos, nos colaboren en todo lo que nos hace falta. Ok. So you saw the video, it provides a little bit of context of these informal settlements, in very informal, poor, dense, that characterizes many of those settlements in Latin America. Actually, I think the statistics show that 25% of the population live in informal settlements. So it's very, very high of this population that lives in this poverty. So I will start with the presentation. Mark, is that okay? Yeah, that's fabulous. Absolutely great. And the video is really interesting. Thank you very much for starting with that. Okay. I'll just let you know if we can see the slides. Yes, please. Let me see. I'll put it here. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we can see that. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay. So I'll start. I'm presenting the results of this quasi experiment with mixed methods. And I want to thank Mark and also Ben for the invitation to this seminar. Really, it's, it's an honor to be here. And um, uh, this project was uh, funded and it's part of the Salurbal project, which is Salud Urbana in America Latina. And it's funded by the Wellcome Trust. So I will present some of the results because it's a large project, but also uh, providing some emphasis on the mixed methods because I know this seminar is about methods. So just a little bit of the international context. It is important to highlight that there are about 24 cities worldwide with cable cars. And the highest concentration, as you can see here in this map, is in um, Latin America. And I think uh, what you see here as an inflection point in 2004, uh, it was one the, for the first time there was a cable car for this very poor population living in hills, in slums, in informal settlements. And that was um, in the city of Medellin, back then uh, the city that was the most violent city in the world. So they started with using cable cars for uh, public transportation. And since then we've seen more cities, especially in the area of Latin America for these uh, very poor populations. So the most recent cable car is Transmicable, the one that you saw on the video, which was inaugurated on December 2018, has 3.4 kilometers, 163 cabins, and four stations. And um, for the first year of inauguration, uh, we have an estimation of 7.5 million passengers. This is in the city of Bogota, where we have about 7.2 million individuals, a large city. And uh, before the pandemic, um, we had about 21,000 passengers per day. During the pandemic, a strict lockdown, 15,000. And now it's, again, we have 25,000 passengers per day in this area. Um, Probably the most important component of this uh, urban transformation, of this transport and urban transformation project is uh, the different urban project that was framed in social urbanism. And these 16 urban projects include like renovation of local markets, community centers, and renovations of parks. So not only the transportation component, but also this urban transformation in the area. But this evaluation is complex because you see that there are so many things going on on the area apart from the transport components. So the first thing that, first thing that we conducted was um, to build a conceptual framework. And for that, we did a group model building. And through the group model building, we built this causal loop diagram that shows the complexity of the evaluation of a project like this one. So how did we build this? We had a workshop with 31 stakeholders that included the academia, uh, also policymakers from different sectors like transport, health, sports and recreation, and also the community. So after that workshop, we built what you see here that are different um, a feedback loops. Some of these uh, feedback loops is what we call a reinforcement or uh, 12 uh, feedback loops that we have more on balance. But basically what I wanna show here is that, that this is complex, that we are not seeing a linear relationship and 
this complex uh, framework also needs um, different methods to better understand the effect of these intervention on the population that we are evaluating. Overall, we found uh, four dimensions that I want to underscore. So here we have uh, obviously the health conditions because this was the first time that we were providing the health lens to this type of evaluations that are out of the health sector. We also have the operationalization of the transmissible, which is very important for our policy makers on urban planning and also uh, mobility. Uh, we have also all the social and economic development that happens when we have this urban transformation. And lastly, we have a civic culture that was very important, especially for the community. So this is our complex um, a framework used for this evaluation. And the main aims, because we have to prioritize and we could not evaluate everything that was uh, in this complex framework, was to first evaluate the effect of Transmicable and its urban transformation on environmental and social determinants of health. And here I'm going to present just a couple of those, transport and some of the air pollution evaluation, health outcomes like health-related quality of life, victimization and homicides healthy behaviors like uh, physical activity, and we also use citizen science by the people and ripple effects mapping. These are qualitative components to identify barriers and facilitators of livability that could affect health and also could affect uh, the uh, quality of life of our population. So this is the design of our natural experiment just to uh, place you in the context of uh, the Americas. Here we have Colombia in the north part of South America, and in the center we have Bogota, which is the capital city. Here is the map of Bogota, and here on the south part of Bogota we have the poorest areas, and here we have our intervention group, Ciudad Bolívar, and the control group, San Cristóbal. So for our design, what we had was a buffer of 800 meters, which is larger than you have seen in many of these evaluations, just because of the dynamics of this population. So it's a buffer of 800 meters around the stations of the cable car. And our control group is actually selected because of the socioeconomic um, characteristics, but also is the next cable car projected for the city. So we have an 800 buffer around basically what is projected to be the cable car of this area. Um, from these uh, two areas, uh, we conducted um, multi-stage sampling design. First blocks, that are the ones that you see here, uh, you see here these blocks were selected with probability proportional to the density of the properties. You saw that it's very dense, changes all the time. That's what we see on the informal settlement. So we had to work with the planning department, but also collect some of the inside data to see what was going on in these uh, different households. Then um, we uh, systematically selected um, every third home for the evaluation. And then we selected according to the inclusion criteria, the one adult per household. So um, uh, we estimated that we needed after non-response date about uh, 700 individuals per each site, but with no response data, we aim for about 800. So um, what was the phases of our natural experiment? First on baseline using mixed methods, I will show that in a minute. Uh, we collected uh, our quantitative and qualitative component. As you saw, the implementation of the program and some of the urban transformation, not all, occur on December 2018. Then uh, we did our first follow up on from July 2019 to March 2020 uh, using also mixed methods, but then we had the pandemic. So we had to finish, especially our qualitative component for the first phase uh, do, was virtual on August uh, 2020. So going into our mixed method uh, methodology, we use a convergent mixed method study with a simultaneous bidirectional design for the integration of the data. And I'll show you a little bit how we integrated this data 
from the design to the methods, but also for reporting these um, results. So the, at, the in, at the design level, we collected quantitative and qualitative data that were analyzed separately, but in the same team for time frame, and then compared by the two teams, the teams of qualitative, uh, which are mainly anthropologists, and our team with uh, quantitative data, which are uh, mainly uh, engineers and uh, economists and epidemiologists. Um, that was at the design level. I'll show you a little bit how that was done. And then we started doing the integration within the methods uh, level and with the analysis. For that, we use our three procedures. The first one is matching, which, which we take domain by domain or construct by construct and we match. So for instance, transport, transport time, transport satisfaction, what is uh, collected from the quantitative and the qualitative data and we compare both, uh, both uh, methodologies. And we use also some diffracting which is using cuts of data to understand the phenomenon. So for instance, for quality of life at the quantitative component, we needed to analyze a little bit what was the social capital construct that was related that, that was very helpful, the data that we have from uh, qualitative uh, methodologies. And overall, we use uh, uh, merging all the time, which was using the two databases, the two analysis, and all the time doing this uh, comparison uh, in different matrices. Uh, at the reporting level, which was very important, and that's why we also used uh, some qualitative uh, data in this uh, study, was very important, especially for our policymakers and for the translation. And so for that, we use narratives, some data transformation, especially for the qualitative component that we need to prioritize and rank the themes how they change from baseline to the intervention and how they um, were then compared to the quantitative component. Some joint displays, um, especially for policy briefs. And we use visualization, um, specifically we use GIS data, but also you saw in the video a lot of urban art. So we also use some of this urban art for the visualization, especially for the policy briefs for our policy makers. So for the quantitative component, these are the instruments that we use, household surveys, transport diaries, um, monitors uh, for um, the pollutants that we evaluated on the, on the air quality component. Uh, for the uh, physical activity in a subsample, we use objective measurements with accelerometers. And for observing the parks, we use uh, so Park to have a more contextual evaluation. Our analysis that I will show is difference in different methods that we use, but also for especially for the um, for the um, air pollution, since we had just a small sample and we were simulating the trips, we also had a Monte Carlo simulation that helped us to understand the potential decrease in the inhaled dose when we have uh, the cable car incorporated in a trip. For the qualitative component, um, the instruments that we use first are group model building that help us to uh, build the causal loop diagram, the complex uh, framework that we had. We have some semi-structure interviews, especially with community leaders and also some uh, policy makers. We use our citizen science uh, model, which is our voice model by the people developed by Abby King in Stanford and that Ben has used extensively. And we use all also ripple effects mapping, but only in the intervention group to assess those intended and unintended consequences of the intervention. And the data analysis, we basically use a semantic analysis following, following a grounded theory approach to develop basically a livability framework that is apply, applicable to our cultural context. So this is the methodology of our voice for those who are not very familiar. We have these uh, first four steps and the fifth one is more how we integrate it in this uh, methodology, the ripple effects mapping. So first we collect um, the individuals, the participants that we call citizen scientists, collect uh, the, the data of barriers and facilitators of healthy living or livability in our case or a, in this uh, neighborhood. So they go with an app and they collect the data. Then we have community meetings with the residents. After that, in the third part, we have a discussion with our community members and prioritize those uh, barriers and facilitators that they identify. The fourth is a, um, a step is basically sharing that information. We facilitate sharing this information between community and policymakers. 
And we added here a fifth element, which is just for the individuals, the, the citizen scientists in the intervention group to um, through the ripple effects mapping methodology to tell us about those intended and in, unintended consequences of the implementation in this case of the cable car. So let me show you a little bit how we collect the data. So we use a very low key cell phone, nothing sophisticated. Uh, then uh, the individual is start uh, the walking with us, the researchers. Uh, they start walking and after they start walking, they take pictures. And then after they take pictures, they review the picture and we ask them, tell us about that picture and tell us if it was a barrier or a facilitator, if it's algo good, if it's something good or for the community or something bad for your community. Uh, then they record that something that in Colombia they like a lot because we have some people that are, are uh, they have some difficulties with the technology, although we have seen that it's easy overall to be used, but they like to record uh, their voice and tell us about what they see in these pictures. Um, and they continue taking the pictures, then we, the app geocodes, um, the walking that they were doing, so we can also identify that with geographic information systems, and then it's uploaded to the Stanford um, server, and we can analyze later on those pictures and the audios with the individuals that we call the citizen scientists, and they, they, they love that term in Spanish as well. For the ripple effects mapping, uh, this is again another participatory evaluation method. Here, participants on the intervention um, can visually map and do basically a collective mind mapping and group interview process. And basically, with, through that mapping, what they do is to uh, report on intended and unintended outcomes that we call the ripples, in this case, for the implementation of the cable car. So at the methods level, this is how we integrated the data collection because I told you that we actually um, have this uh, by direct simultaneous bidirectional design from the beginning since the collection of the data. So first, before the implementation of the cable car, we have some semi-structure interviews with community leaders. Then here we started both the qua quantitative component, which is the household survey with the objective measurements as well, but at the same time, uh, an if some of our groups were conducting the walks for the our voice model for citizen scientists uh, a evaluation of the environment and we also were conducting the meetings with the citizen scientists so everything on baseline here we have the implementation of the cable car then for the first wave after the implementation of the cable car, we again do the survey. And at the same time, we do again the walks with the individuals. Uh, we do the community meetings with the individuals to prioritize those barriers and facilitators of, what, of the pictures that they took. And we also included the ripple effects mapping only in the intervention group. And we did some follow-up, especially with policymakers that were very involved with the community and the implementation of the cable car and are also involved in the implementation of the next cable car, which is our control group. So just to give you some of the results, I'll start with the quantitative component. Uh, we have a sample of uh, 2,000 individuals, about 1,000 in our intervention group and 1,000 in the control group. And also you see here the, sub the numbers of individuals in the subsamples. And for the follow-up, we had an 82% uh, response rate based uh, here on the household um, surveys. Some of the characteristics of our study population, as you saw in the neighborhood, very poor populations. Our population is basically on average, I have uh, 44 years. Uh, what we see is that most of them are females. Uh, this is what we see in most of our surveys and the surveys conducted by the government. And although they both are the poorest population within this poorest population, our intervention group is more poor. On, and this is based on education and income. See here, for instance, 40.6% of the intervention group have elementary school or less than that, as opposed to 28% of our control group. And in, with respect to, and 
but overall we see that they have low education um, in these uh, both in intervention and control group and also with income we also see that we have a highest percentage of individuals living with just a minimum wage or less than a minimum wage which is 280 dollars uh, for Colombia uh, but this and this percentage is higher for the intervention group compared to the control group so within these very um, poor populations we had some differences that we had to control for uh, in terms of our qualitative component of our citizen scientists, citizen science uh, model, which is using this our voice, we collected data from 54 residents, and you see here the WACs that were mapped here in the intervention and in the control group. They took 600 uh, photographs and four, 547 audio recordings that were analyzed uh, with our team on qualitative data. And on ripple effects mapping, we evaluated that on nine citizen scientists that were community leaders from also the component of our voice model. And we map everything using the XMind uh, mapping tool that has been developed for um, evaluating the ripple effects mapping. So some of the results. So the first thing is the mobility, which we know this is the first, the most important thing initially for policymakers, which was what happened with the mobility. So look at this. You probably saw that also in the video. This is the evolution of the transport in this area. In the 80s, they had the donkey. Then they had the jeep. No public transportation, as the women said in the video. Um, then they had the public transport, and now they have the cable car. This is the evolution that we see on mobility. Most of these population are not car dependent. Most of the population, as you can see in this graph, they use public transportation or combinations with public and active or public or informal, but everything is related with public transportation. From time zero to time one, we see that 12% reported regularly using the cable car, 12%, which is corresponds to these 21,000 uh, trips that I show you initially. We don't see many changes on uh, San Cristobal, so they continue to using the public transport. The cable car is just a feeder of the mass transit uh, system. But um, most of the population, about 76%, have ever used this uh, cable car. Why do they use it? What are the main reasons to use it? Time and safety. And safety actually becomes even sometimes more important than time. Our hypothesis initially was time, but time and safety are becoming very, very important. Uh, and some of them don't use it because they feel that they are very far, so they probably have they have problems with access. They also have fear to heights. That's normal. But an important percentage, almost ten percent, uh, now ha have a problem with the cost. The fare is expensive for this population. Although it's just um, in terms of dollars less than a dollar, uh, it could be twenty to twenty five percent of the monthly income of this population. So it's, it's a problem. What happened with the average travel time, which was the most important thing um, that was expected by our government? It decreased as expected. Um, and here we have the different stages, the total time, what happens in the vehicle, what happens in the waiting time, or when they walk from to the cable or after they take the cable car. So overall, we see a, de a decrease of 22 minutes. Uh, but varies uh, a lot, like if they live very far, it could be uh, 50 minutes or 70 minutes, but the average is 20.6 uh, minutes. What we see that decrease a lot, and it's very important, is the waiting time. That's when, when individuals are more concerned, so that, that's important. However, we see an important disparity by gender. We see that the decrease in time is higher for males compared to females, except for the component of walking that was higher for females compared to males. So as expected, we had a decrease in time, but it's higher for males. What did our qualitative component tell us? So with, these are the recurrent themes. Um, the individuals, the citizen scientists reported that uh, Transmillennial Local Service uh, improves a lot. However, they feel the great difference between being in a cable car as opposed to being in the mass transit in the BRT. They, the recurrent theme is that travel time decreases, they have more transport availability and more transport satisfaction. That was very 
very uh, convergent uh, compared to the quantitative and the qualitative component. But in the ripple effects mapping, as in addition to travel time, transport satisfaction, there was a report of the discomfort of the fare and the time when between they have to take, they have to pay again for the service. So in general, uh, we see that uh, the both the quantitative and the qualitative component, they complement or they, they are convergent, which is what you see in this matrix. Is, and that's what we do uh, for every single domain, every single construct is what happened with the quantitative component. So here we see a decrease then what happens with the our voice model the different themes that emerge after the qualitative analysis what happened with the ripple effects mapping and then we see if there was uh, something that was we see convergence or divergence or complementary so here we have something that is very convergent both results show that um, there was an improving objective and perceived travel time as expected uh, but here we also see some complementary we didn't explore much um, what happens on the transport affordability. affordability. We just uh, included um, if they didn't use it because it was expensive. But here, it, the report on ripple effects mapping was very important, especially for our government, because um, they they actually ask for more time between the time that they have to pay an additional fare so they can use more the cable car. But in, in, uh, in general, we have a convergence complementary for the component of transport. Now, physical activity. That was something unusual for our policymakers. They didn't think that was important, but we included this in our evaluation because we wanted to include the lens of health in these evaluations out of the health sector. So here you see a picture of the park that was renovated in the poorest area of the intervention group. And just to remind you, these were the different methods that we use quantitatively to evaluate the parks and the behavior in the individuals. So here in these graphs, what you see are the graphs with the accelerometry data. So we see, for instance, that the users of Transmicable have higher mean minutes of vigorous to, uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity. However, remember that they said, well, now we have more time, time, uh, we have saved time. You saw it in the video, we saw it in the qualitative component, the quantitative component, but still there are very long days. We see activity from 4 a.m. in the morning. So they are reporting that they have more time, but it's a time now they don't have to wake at 3.30 a.m., but they have to work, wake up at 4 a.m. And we see activity activity until 11 p.m. So still there are very long days for these individuals. But in terms of physical activity, what we see here is that those who use the cable car, especially males again, are more likely to have higher uh, mean minutes of moderate and vigorous uh, physical activity. But when we analyze the data on our intervention and our control group from time zero to time one, we really don't see differences. I mean, this is a population that were active, as you can see here in the main minutes, more active than what I see in the general population of Bogota, Colombia, or internationally, because our population, that they have to walk because they don't have other choice. It's a need. So they walk, uh, they continue walking, in both the intervention and the control group and the Kranzmikable users were more active and they continue to be active. And it's good that they continue to be active. Now we have more need more safety for these individuals to continue doing a behavior that it's good for their health. In terms of sedentary time, which we also measure with the accelerometry data, we see a pattern that we're seeing all the time that the sedentary time is increasing. We saw it also in our national survey but we see that this increment on the weekend is higher in the control compared to the intervention group. Um, I don't see uh, the sample size of the accelerometry is, is small, so I don't see those changes just on the ones who are users of the transmicable. So it's something probably related also with the urban transformation, but that's a pattern that we are seeing on sedentary behavior, but no changes in physical activity. But what happened with our parks? So we did an observation because we know that the individual behavior 
takes it takes really a long time to change. So we wanted to see what happened on the parks. So we use this uh, systematic observation with so Park. And what you are seeing here is that from time zero to time one in our intervention group, we see an increment both for females and males, but the delta, the change is larger for the females. And it's different from our uh, control group. So um, the important thing is that when we observe also the occupation, the occupation was mainly for women and children, and we are seeing that also they are being, uh, they are, when we observe them, we also see that uh, we observe more women uh, doing MVPA um, as compared to what see, I mean, what we see in the Delta on, on females. So that was good because these uh, parks uh, now are implemented with very, a lot of amenities for children, for um, older adults and for adults. So, so we also uh, want to promote more physical activity during the leisure time because what they are doing is basically for uh, transport, which is what is reflected in the accelerometry and also so what we saw with the IPE. So what happened with the qualitative component, our voice? Walking wasn't um, something reported or for health. In fact, when we started doing this project, both the community and the stakeholders, they didn't have health in their minds for this implementation. But was, what was a recurrent theme here from our voice model was the park satisfaction. They were reported more satisfaction with the parks and the, all the transformation that they saw in their neighborhoods. But at the same time, they reported more insecurity on parks and the drug use. That's something that, that was something that we didn't evaluate on the quantitative component. We didn't find more uh, things on the ripple effects mapping, but this was a recurrent theme. Individuals, uh, our citizen scientists are reporting that the parks are nice, but they are not safe. And that's a high concern, especially for women. So when we analyze um, and integrated the data from the quantitative and the qualitative component, we see more uh, complementary. So we see that um, there's um, a higher satisfaction because the, there's more parks availability. However, there is a concern of uh, the perceived unsafety in the parks and also the drug use in the parks. So that was related to physical activity. So now let's move to another, <laughs> another component and this is air quality. So this, what you see here, we have this cable car, which is electric with the solar panels, so they can have also Wi-Fi inside the cabins, um, so they can also uh, communicate with um, the, the main uh, operator and feel safer. Uh, so what we did was to evaluate the quality of the air, but in micro environments. Why did we do that and we didn't use the ground uh, um, ground information that we have from, from our monitors, basically because they are very far from the area. This is an area that has been built informally, so it's very, very far from many of the main uh, evaluations and main monitoring system of the city. So what we did was to use all these uh, devices that you see here to um, evaluate uh, PM 2.5, black carbon, carbon monoxide, and that was conducted on the different uh, microenvironments within each trip. So for instance, if I was walking, I take the cable car, then I take the BRT and then they walk, I have all these microenvironments that are being evaluated both on baseline and also in the follow-up. So this graph, actually illustrates the baseline air pollutant concentrations that you see here. And here we see that the lowest was for pedestrians. That's something that we've seen in our, in our city. But then after the implementation of the cable car, we also see that what we measure, the concentrations of the pollutants that we measure inside of the cable car are lower than what we see on the buses, on the Transmica, Transmilenio or on the informal um, uh, buses, which is something that we expected. And it's very important because our, our contamin the contamination within the regular buses are very high right now, although our fleet is changing. But we wanted also to estimate the inhale dose of these individuals. So we estimated the inhale dose in the different um, stages of the trips. So what you see here is like, for instance, for black carbon, the inhale dose that we estimated is 10 times lower than uh, what we see in the regular bus. Uh, we have five times lower inhale dose in our PM 2.5 in our cable car. 
and nine times lower um, in our cable car compared to the regular feeder. Remember the cable car is also a feeder, but it's a faster feeder and a cleaner feeder because it's run by electricity. Um, so we also recognize, of course, that nobody takes just the cable car. The cable car is a feeder. So we needed to um, simulate the whole trip and to see to what extent the inclusion of a feeder that is electric, less pollutant, could decrease what could be the inhaled dose per trip. So that's why we did this Monte Carlo simulation. And we see, obviously, uh, that um, when we have the cable car and Transmilenio versus a regular feeder of Transmilenio, and we see that for all, all, all the other comparisons, but I here brought just two for the sake of simplicity, is that um, we have a lower uh, concentration, or, well, lower actually inhaled dose, which is what we have here in this simulation. However, still is very high. It's very high because they are using regular buses or are using Transmilenio, which all in that time when we evaluated was run mainly on diesel. So we still have problems with uh, air pollution that uh, and the inhaled those in these different uh, vehicles, but it's reducing and we expect less more reduction now there that our fleet is being changed to gas and to uh, some of them to electric. So we'll see what happened in further evaluations uh, because it's still if you see the concentrations are very high. And finally, what happened with a uh, health related quality of life. Um, and here, I didn't show you here the qualitative component because actually most of the environmental concerns of our population were related to garbage and uh, to the bodies of water, but not much about air pollution. That was not a theme that was prevalent on our qualitative component. And lastly, now uh, we have the health related quality of life. And here we use in the quantitative component, the WH quality of life questionnaire. And what we found is the following. So we usually, we don't see in these areas changes on quality of life. And usually, as you can see here in the, these graphs that are the purple ones is that women have lower scores than men, which are the blue ones on quality of life, both for the intervention and the control group. But the interesting thing that we found is that from time zero to time one, we see an increase on these scores, but just among women. We don't see the same for men. So we saw an increment on the score. It's relatively small increment, but given that we usually do not see changes on quality of life in this population was a, an important, even if it was significant, uh, the, that we, we consider important, the government also consider important for after the implementation of the cable car. So for the qualitative component here, we use more um, the refracting uh, component in which to try to understand the qualitative component, we also um, analyze more elements uh, from social capital, like social cohesion, community networks, to understand uh, also the, the, quality, the quantitative component. Um, so what we see as an emergent themes here from our voice model, the citizen science model was, um, more uh, report on the importance of social cohesion and how they see an, an important social cohesion that helped them having the cable car, but also that increase after the implementation. And also uh, there was another thing that was very important is the community networks, the empowerment of the community uh, networks for um, having now this transformation in the area of the cable car. And in the ripple effects mapping, we have an emerging theme that we also didn't consider in our quantitative component. And it was the reduction of the social stigma and more pride of for the neighborhood. That's very important. People in Ciudad Bolivar are very stigmatized because it's the poorest area, is the most violent area, is where we have the immigration from internal displacement. So um, they also feel that this type of transformation, the presence of the state, these programs uh, could reduce the social stigma. And it was an emerging theme that we didn't consider on our quantitative uh, component, and that could be related with quality of life. So here for our analysis, 
of the quantitative and the qualitative component, we see convergent um, uh, domains, but we also see complementary domains, especially when we see that complementary between uh, the stigma and also the quality of life and also the trust in the government. Our uh, one uh, component and the quantitative component was that the trust of that distrust decrease a little bit. Still, there's a population that do not trust the government, but decrease a little bit. Um, that uh, could be complemented with also that um, stigma reduction that was reported on the qualitative component. So we see convergence here, and we see complementary here on these uh, indicators within this uh, domain of social cohesion and local democracy. Now to end, um, remember that the last part of the evaluation of our voice model was a meeting between community and policymakers, in which they prior the community we facilitate that, but the community tell the policymakers what are could be solutions or what are good things that they are seeing after the transformation of the area after the implementation of this program. So we have community leaders. In this case, we put together control and intervention group. And it was important because the control group wanted to know what they needed to do for having the next cable car. We also have policymakers from the urban development, from the health ministry, from the Transmillennial uh, company, from the mobility secretariat, from sports and recreations, and from the women's secretariat. So main things that emerged from this from these, um, meeting was, first, the community um, told the policymakers, especially for the sports and recreation and the mobility secretariat, that they think that if they have more programs in their parks, they could reduce some of the uh, problems of security or illegal uh, substances that they see in the parks. That was one thing. The second thing that emerged on this um, a dialogue that they have was that citizens, scientists, and policymakers committed to have regular workspaces to prioritize concerns that was for both the intervention and the control group. Um, and the other component that um, was very important was that policymakers uh, told the community that this program, this urban transformation, the cable car was a program, a project of the community, and it was um, conducted thanks to the community's active, patient, and persistent participation. So these recognitions from policymakers to the community of this project was very important for community appropriation of these type of programs. And lastly, that's something that I, I underscores more for us uh, in academia, was that policymakers also recognized that it was important to have this type of studies. And it was important for them to recognize um, these uh, potential effects of these uh, interventions that were not considered previously by them because um, health was not there. Especially, for instance, uh, the manager for Transmicali told us, oh, it was really nice to collect data on, from the public health perspective. And that's something that we will consider in the future. So just um, to finish, these were the main conclusions. So first, we found through our this analysis and this short evaluation, because it's only six months, one year after the implementation, reduction of travel time, satisfaction with transport, higher levels of, the, of physical activity of those who use the cable car, more women doing physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity in parks, and higher satisfaction with parks availability, although concerns with insecurity and drug use. We also uh, found a reduction on the exposure and also on the inhaled dose on the trip that involves transmicable. We also found increase in health-related quality of life among women. And it was very important what the citizen science brought, which was this redu reduction of a stigma in their locality. And we also want to highlight that part of the project and the way we conducted really required a constant partnership with the academia, the community, the policymakers to all the time being able to do this, uh, do this bidirectional um, analysis between uh, different actors and using different methodologies. What happened after evaluation? How these data has been used? One important thing, 
there's a continued dialogue between leaders of the intervention and control group, especially for the control group, because leaders in the intervention group told them, um, you have to continue to uh, be there, be present, because uh, things can change from administration to administration. And that was the case on uh, the intervention group. So that constant uh, dialogue has been important. Um, the first prog product that we had was a policy brief. And those indicators were used in the current development plan to advocate in part for the cable cars for the city. Now we have nine cable cars in the development plan, but uh, one is funded, which is our control group. Uh, we also use uh, they, our government used that component of the qualitative analysis of the affairs that happen from the ripple effects mapping. They use part of that argument to increase the time. They the first still the same. It's expensive for some of the population, but at least they increase the time uh, between uh, the time that they have to pay for another for another trip in the cable car. So for now, they have about an hour, and that helps them to do some errands before having to pay for another another um, trip. Um, Physical activity classes. Remember, they recommended programs in the parks. That was difficult, but, and that's what you see in this picture, uh, at least they have uh, some physical activity classes, the IDRD, the Sports and Recreation Department, on the top of one of the stations. You see the cable car, and see, here you see children and women and older adults dancing, which is what we love to do in Latin America. Uh, so we don't have the programs in the parks, but at least they do physical activity classes now in one of the station, which is um, something important. And um, we also started a dialogue with other interventions in the region, with an intervention in Chile, an intervention in Brazil, and that has been important for uh, advancing many of these evaluations in which we want to have the lens of health in these type of evaluations. And finally, remember that some of our policymakers in our voice model said, oh, this is nice to have the mixed methods and to understand uh, all these components of this evaluation. So actually, we finished a course with 22 policymakers uh, from the planning, local and national uh, department and from the, the uh, mobility secretary. It's an introductory course of how to use mixed methods in their evaluations. So I just want to thank the amazing team that we have. Uh, which are from different disciplines, because we cannot do that with, uh, without having different disciplines in the team. And any questions, I will be happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Olga. Absolutely fantastic.